Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can everybody hear me? Sister Farina, Sister Wafia, you guys can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, alhamdulillah. Welcome. Welcome everyone to the class. Alhamdulillah, class 10. We're like, subhanAllah, halfway through the surah. Almost at the end of September. So we only have one full month of November. We'll be finishing off the surah, inshallah, sometime in November. So almost there, alhamdulillah, halfway. Okay, welcome everyone to Tafsir Surah Hud, Tears of Love. Okay. Inshallah, somebody can hear me and see me. We'll start now, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa afdalu salati wa atamu taslim ala Sayyidina Rasulullah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, we are going to, inshallah, begin with verse 60, which I had wanted to do last week, uh, just to finish off um, Ad. Uh, the story of uh, the people of Ad that Hud alayhi salam was sent to, we just had one verse left. Okay, so inshallah, let's finish off that verse, number 60. It is on your screen. And they were followed in this dunya world, a curse. Wa and Yoma day al Qiyama and on the day of judgment. Allah, indeed, Allah, inna again, these are articles of affirmation or emphasis. Emphasis. Indeed, Adan, Ad, the people of Ad, Kafaru denied Rabbahum, their Lord, Allah, Bu'adan li Adan, Qomhut. So, Bu'adan, we had um, explained this when uh, this, a similar phrase was mentioned with regards. Um, Actually, it is with regards to Ad that it is mentioned, and we'll see it later with Thamud. So actually, you haven't seen it before, right? Um, so Ba'ad is distance. Literally, it means distance. Li'ad, for the people of Ad, Omihu, the people of Hud. Okay, so Ad, the people of Hud, are, uh, there is a Ba'ad uh, mentioned with regards to them, distance, and we're going to actually explain what it means. They were pursued by a curse in this world, and so will they be on the day of judgment. Lo Ad disbelieved in their Lord. Lo Ad are ruined the people of Hud. So we see here that the result of Ad's behavior that we talked about last week, it was not limited simply to punishment in this world. Rather, we learn from this ayah that an eternal curse rests upon that started in this world. They were followed by a curse in this world. As they will be on the day of judgment. So it's going to continue on affecting them, their choices in this world, their behavior and response to their messenger in this world is going to continue to impact them and follow them and be upon them forever into the akhirah. So ba'da, this word I thought that we had covered, but actually we had not. Um, so uh, when it says Allah the translation given here, so away with Aad, right? Bu'ad literally means distance, right? So away with them, uh, the people of Hud, it really is a dua for destruction. It's 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 an expression to express distance from the mercy of Allah. I mean, they are far from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that uh, they are in a state of humiliation. And it's, this is an expression that indicates being removed from all khair and being near, close to all evil or shar, right? So it's a horrible place to be in. It's the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that of the believers, as the tafsir mentioned. So the curse of Allah is upon them. The curse of the believers is upon them whenever, wherever they are mentioned because they died upon this insistent, persistent kufr. And rejection of their uh, messenger. Um, now, by the way, if someone is a pan kufr and is a persistent rejecter of truth, etc., you cannot send la'ana on them as long as they're alive, okay? Even no matter how, uh, what the state of their, um, you know, kufr is, we, you, you, no one is supposed to send la'ana or curse upon uh, anyone. This is not something that we do, okay? We don't curse people. We don't 
wish destruction for them. You know, we don't declare them to be removed from Allah's mercy. We don't behave in this way. We don't speak in this way. Uh, this is only the uh, domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, uh, when we know that, you know, they have been distanced uh, from the mercy of Allah, then of course, when they are mentioned, when these verses are recited, then the believers also know the state that they're in. Um, and Sheikh Zuhaili actually mentions in his tafsir explaining the part about how it says that they're followed by a curse in this world as they will be on the day of judgment. So a curse will follow them on the day of judgment as well. Sheikh Zuhaili mentions in his tafsir that how on the day of judgment, in front of everyone, this statement is going to be called out. Which is extreme humiliation, extreme uh, extreme, and there's no word for the level of humiliation that these people will suffer on the day of judgment before all of creation. Uh, that you know, this type of statement will be made about them. So, you know, this is the consequence of kufr, this is the consequence of rejecting and denying in spite of truth. Uh, that is clearly placed before you by a merciful, kind messenger who is um, from amongst you, whom you know very well, whose character you, you know, were vouching for yesterday and are rejecting him today that he has called you to Tawheed. This is the consequence of denying the one who created you, of denying the Akhirah and denying the favors of the one, um, the, of the one who bestows those favors upon you and allows you to enjoy them. So, before we think that, oh, you know, this is too much punishment, this is too much humiliation, this is just not fair, why are, you know, they being punished in this way, et cetera, et cetera. First of all, we have to be very careful before we question um, any of these things, because in fact, we would be questioning the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the adil, the justice of Allah. And part of his justice is that he, the mighty are taken to task for their arrogance and their denial and their mistreatment of the messengers and the weak that they were able to do because of their strength, right? And how because of that strength and influence, they effectively lead astray countless masses that just, you know, blindly follow them. Um, but they're, they have that influence because of their might and their dominance. So this is part of justice, uh, you know, towards the weak, towards the downtrodden, towards those that were mistreated and oppressed, that those responsible are held responsible, are taken to account. So this is not um, harshness on the part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, it would be unfair to those who suffered at the hands of these people if they were not brought to justice. Just like we don't uh, say that um, you know, a criminal that is sentenced to a certain punishment, uh, that that punishment is unjust or harsh on the part of the judge. Rather, it is justice for the victims. Right? So we can understand very clearly uh, from that example. Um, so the lesson here is that we need to realize the seriousness of our actions and their consequences. This is a, a story, an example that tells us how important and critical our time in this life is and the choices that we make in this world and the type of lifestyle that we um, choose to adopt. When it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messengers and our response to them, um, when it comes to our deen, um, it is very, very serious what kinds of choices we make, what kinds of actions we take or the lack thereof, right? Note the way Ad behaved in this world has affected them forever. So our action, our choices in this life are not inconsequential, rather they ripple into eternity. Okay, let's look at verse 61, the next verse. Wa'ila and two Thamud. So that concludes, 60 concludes the story of uh, Ad, the people of Hud alayhi salam. Now we're going to, in, into Thamud, the people whom Salih alayhi salam was sent to. And this begins from verse 61. Wa and ila to Thamud, the people of Thamud, Akhahum, their brother Salih alayhi salam is the messenger that is sent to, uh, the prophet that is sent to um, Thamud. Qala, he said, Ya qawm, O oh my people, ya qawm, Allah, worship Allah, ma, ma not lakum for you, min, from ilahin, a 
a lord. Um, okay, I've just received a message that we are not on uh, Facebook. So if Aisha could just check, if admin could just check what the problem is, uh, inshallah, and just correct that. So we are in verse 61. And to Thamud, their brother Salih, Saliha, who said, he said, oh, my people worship Allah not for you from a God other than him, غيره, other than him. Huwa, he is the one. He, Ansha'akum, originated you min from al arud the earth. Wasta'marakum fiha. Wasta'marakum, he made you dwell, referring to the earth. He made you dwell fiha, in it. Fasta'ufiru, so seek his forgiveness. Thumma, then tubu, turn to him in repentance. Ilayhi, to him. Tubu, yani, uh, turn to him in repentance. Inna indeed a Rabbi, my Lord, Qareeb, very close Mujib, one who answers. Okay, 61. And to Thamud, we sent their brother Saleh. He said, my people serve Allah. You have no God, but he, he brought you into being out of the earth and has made you dwell in it. So ask him to forgive you and to turn towards him in repentance. Indeed, my Lord is near, responsive to prayers. Okay. So, often the Quran we find after the mention of Aad, the people of Hud, السلام, you have the mention of Thamud, the people to whom Saleh السلام, was sent. And um, it is mentioned in one of the tafsirs that they were actually another branch of the tribe of Aad. And they lived in northern Arabia and they lived in the valley of Hijr. And this area is between Tabuk and Al Madina. So, Ibn Kathir mentions uh, the same, that there were a group of people, the Thamud were a group of people who were living in cities carved from rocks between Tabuk and al Madina. So we have another very mighty nation, uh, a very mighty, mighty people, not nation, but a very mi mighty people uh, that um, occupy this area, this land tract, and they are strong enough to actually build their dwellings, carve. They have the technology or the know-how, the skill or the expertise to actually carve out um, their residences from rocks, from mountains, right? And to them, uh, their brother, to this ancient people, their brother Saleh is sent. And again, he is not a stranger to them. He is one from among them. And he asked them the same thing that Hudar is summoned to ask Ad, right? To worship Allah alone. There is no God other than Allah. Like, so where are you going? Who else are you going to? And then we see Salih Alayhisam begins to speak of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his actions of mercy towards the people, how he brought you forth from the earth, right? Ibn Kathir comments on this that yani, he began your creation from it, from the earth. From it, he created your father Adam Alayhisam and established you therein. Yani made you prosperous in the earth. You are settled in it and you treasure it, right? So they were very well to do, very prosperous, very established, well established. Uh, people. This, this is not just like a, you know, poor downtrodden group. No, they're very well established, very prosperous, and they have influence and sway in the land. So, Saudi Arabia directs them, after mentioning these blessings, how you should seek forgiveness and turn to Allah's hand and repentance. And I was thinking why this particular point was mentioned about being brought forth from the earth and being established in the earth. Why is this particular aspect highlighted here? And Maudud actually had yeah, the answer for me. It's because this is the proof of the claim that you have no other deity than other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says the argument is based on the fact which the mushriks themselves acknowledge, which is Allah is their creator. They acknowledge this fact. So Salih al-Islam is Arguing, you yourselves acknowledge that it is Allah who has created your wonderful human body out of lifeless particles of the earth. And it is he who has made the earth a suitable place for you to live. How can there be any other deity other than Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, who may be worthy of Godhead, of service, of worship, of ibadah, right? And if you know about the earth, for those of you that are, have even the slightest interest in astronomy, is that how no other planet can support life, right? Pretty much, what, I mean, we're trying to populate Mars. Some people are trying to populate Mars, but you know, there, as far as we know, 
there is um, no other place that can, uh, you know, that we can dwell in. And so this is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he created a place just right for us and fulfilled all of our needs uh, in that place, right, in, on earth. So one of the things we also, uh, so that's obviously a negation of shirk, right? You acknowledge you as your Lord, so then you should worship him alone. Um, and the other thing, so this is the um, point of aqidah, the, the first thing that I just mentioned about if he is the creator, then he should be worshipped. This is how, um, you know, the fact that he is Rabb, that he has created you, um, and therefore he should be worshipped only and alone by you is how Rabubiya necessitates Uluhiya. Some of you have taken um, this in Aqidah before. How the fact that he is the Rabb, that he is uh, the creator, the nourisher, the sustainer. And therefore, and this is something um, all the Mushrikeen, you know, throughout the ages, you know, um, you will see Mushrikeen in various times and spaces have always acknowledged God, Allah, as the Rabb. We see that here, the people of Thamud, who were otherwise Mushrikeen, polytheists. And we see that in with the Quraysh, with the people of Mecca that the Rasulullah was sent to, were Mushrikeen. However, they acknowledge that Allah is the Rabb. He is the creator, the sustainer, the nourisher, provider, etc. So we have an understanding in our aqidah is that Ar-Rabubiya, the fact that he is the Rabb, necessitates Uluhiya, Uluhiya referring to Godhead, the exclusive right to be worshipped alone, right? So that's uh, the first uh, thing that I want to mention. The second thing I want to mention that we learn from here is that Allah's blessings, which are cited here, right, that he uh, brought you forth from the earth, he established you in the earth. These are blessings of Allah. So we learn that Allah's blessings are also a reason. They are also something that should prompt us to make istighfar. Because after Saudi Lisa mentions that he is the one who produced you from the earth and settled you in it, what does it say right after that? So seek his forgiveness. Turn to him in repentance. Right? And uh, immediately what comes to mind is the wording of one of the greatest ways to make istighfar and the dua that is called Sayyid al-Istighfar, which means the leader of istighfar. So it's the, one of the best ways that we can ask Allah's forgiveness, right? We, Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa anta khalaqtani wa ana amatuk wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'adika ma istata'at a'udhu bika min shadri ma sunat abu'uluka bi ni'amatika alayya wa abu'u bi dhambi now what does that part mean? abu'uluka bi ni'amatika alayya wa abu'u bi dhambi faghfir li fa innahu la yaghfiru dhunuba illa ant so that last part of the dua which inshallah we'll have um, posted on the group if you like Abu Uluka bin Amatika Aliya, I acknowledge your blessings upon me. Wa Abu Ubi Dhambi, and I confess my sins. So forgive me. For no one forgives sins other than you, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So acknowledging Allah's blessings and then confessing your sins simultaneously is something that naturally prompts one to istighfar because how do you make up for that gap that has occurred you know, between the blessings you are enjoying from him and the disobedience then that is issuing forth? That's not the right response to blessings. The response to blessings ought to be gratitude, not sinning. And if the response to blessings is gratitude, then there shall be increase in those blessings as Allah has promised. And who among us does not want increase in deen, in iman, in wealth, in health, in family, and so on, right? right? We know the ayah from Surah Ibrahim that if you are grateful, we shall increase you, right? So, if, however, if the response to blessings is sinning and is disobedience to the giver of those blessings, then this discrepancy, this ugliness has to be removed through istighfar, through tawbah, right? And so this sin of, a great sin of shirk that they were committing in spite of enjoying Allah's blessings and being in them. And subhanAllah, look how Allah continues to bestow even as he's disobeyed with the sin that is most hateful to him, shirk. And subhanAllah, still he bestows and gives in that period of respite that he extends to them. Still he sends messengers. Look at the mercy, subhanAllah, right? And so 
the verse ends with inna rabbi qareebun mujib right some of the be most beautiful names of allah and all his names are beautiful and some of these beautiful names are mentioned here in na rabbi qareebun mujib he's qareeb he is close so qareeb is in two senses in one sense allah is qareeb to each and every one of us the muslim and the kafir in the sense that he has total knowledge he is close to all of creation the good and the bad um on account of his full knowledge of them and their deeds but the second type right the type all of us crave is al qurb al khas which is that closeness that he has to those who are his worshipers to those who are in love with him to those who ask of him on a regular basis who are continuously at uh you know at his door not that there is a door right uh subhanallah it's so it's so it's so direct the relation to Allah is so direct it, you know i don't like to say that there is a door so he is never far right he's never far so don't delude yourself into thinking that he is too far for us to seek forgiveness and this is actually a problem that the mushrik mindset had and i'm going to repeat it um you see in verse 61 and, and when thamud is um, when sallallahu uh, alaihi wasallam is speaking to his people which are mushrikeen he's actually uh, dismantling their uh, mindset of shirk when he's saying that he is qareeb because the reason they would commit shirk is because they thought he was not qareeb he was not close he was too far so they needed to commit shirk they needed other gods to get to him right So Maudu Abdul Rahimullah he very insightfully states this in a more detailed way than I just put. He says in this concise sentence the Quran has refuted a grave misunderstanding of the mushriks which has in every age misled people into wrong creeds. They presume that Allah lived far away from them and therefore was unapproachable like their own rulers on earth. as the only way of approach to him was an intercessor who alone could receive and present the requests right uh, so this is how they thought of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but you know whoever is the intercessor you know whoever is the middleman between these people right sometimes it would people who would go to saints or people they thought were close to god and then unfortunately those that priestly class those so called religious figures would then make a business out of it right they would receive um you know a compensation financial compensation some monetary incentives from these individuals or offerings you know or sacrifices etc and then they would be like okay I'll go and sit with you uh for for you with god right so here you know that a whole system is being dismantled by saying that there's no such thing right this uh because this misunderstanding had created all these intercessors and it had created this establishment of priesthood right um and salih alayhi salam here is breaking asunder these false presumptions by saying inna rabbi qareebun mujib allah is near at hand you can invoke his help directly without the help of any interceder he answers prayers he's mujib is mujib he answers prayer mujib is one who answers requests answers prayers right so you can yourself you are quite capable you are in a position to receive you know an answer to your prayer yourself without an uh, interceder right without an intercessor so even though he is the highest the film continues each one of you will find him so near to yourself that you'll be able to convey your request even in a whisper you were allowed to convey your you know subhanallah even when we whisper some thing allah hears it even if we think of something and don't say it out loud allah knows it he knows our duas those that we um express and he also knows those wishes we have not yet uh verbalized into dua and he fulfills even those subhanallah so basically give up the folly of seeking interceders and setting them up as partners and address your prayers to him who is near at hand and who answers prayers now alhamdulillah how are we going to apply this to us alhamdulillah we do not um you know commit shirk inshallah right uh, we do not commit shirk but what are other things that hold us back from turning to allah directly in seeking forgiveness what holds us back from repenting and from um, you know making istighfar 
So I was thinking about this and a few things that came to mind and please, um, in, in the reflection question for this week, share other um, experiences or thoughts that you think, you know, hold us back from turning to Allah Panda in um, asking him for forgiveness. So one thing is of course, attachment to and pleasure in committing a certain sin that, you know, is just so inconvenient to have to give up because the requirement of Toba is to leave the sin. And, you know, it's just so much, this particular sin is so pleasurable or my entire life, lifestyle is so set and so entrenched uh, on a certain pattern, which is unfortunately maybe a pattern of negligence and sin and neg uh, neglecting prayer and, you know, being involved actively in haram, et cetera, astaghfirullah. But once it becomes a lifestyle, it's so much more difficult to come out when there are layers and layers, uh, you know, of hurdles uh, in coming back. And so one of the reasons we don't turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one, re one of the reasons people may not turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek forgiveness, even though he is so close, and make istighfar, even though he answers prayers, is because of the requirement of the atoba, right? Um, is that I'm going to have to give up that sin and I just can't change it, not even for Allah. I, I have to stay in it for my sake. I can't give it up for Allah's sake. I'll stay in it for my sake because my nafs has, has that much power and control and hold over me in my imagination and what I've envisioned for myself as a human being that my nafs is just unable to give it up for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, for the sake of my nafs, I'm going to stay in this life of sin, which I can't give up for Allah's sake. That's, you know, that's really what it comes down to. And it sounds so, you know, bad when you verbalize it that way, but that's really the choice that the people are making, that, that we are making at the, when you want to continue to commit a sin and not give it up for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this situation, what happens is the person is content to sin and can't deal with all the work that will be required to make tawbah and to live a different kind of life. And another reason, the second reason could be um, a very dangerous way of thinking that prevents us from making toba. And this way of thinking can seem very righteous and can seem very humble, but it actually leads to destruction. And what is this thought pattern? Thinking I am too far from Allah because of my sins, because my sins are too many and too numerous. I'm so I'm too far from him now because of my sins to be able to seek his forgiveness. I'm not worthy of his forgiveness because my sins are so many. I don't deserve to be forgiven, right? So actually someone asked uh, Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif this uh, question. I was listening to one of his lectures. And one thing I wanted to say before I tell you what he said is that, you know, Either the person is using this as a cover to continue sinning because it's such an easy cover to just delude yourself with, right? To just, you know, delay uh, making toba, you know, because you just want to continue sinning. So you can say something like that to others or to yourself. Um, but let's say the person really believes this. Okay, let's say the case is not that they're just saying it outwardly in order to use it as an excuse to keep sinning. But let's say they really believe this. They really mean it. But they're really sincerely deluded, right? So then uh, Muhammad al-Shif, he answers this question by saying, well, then who else is the sinner going to turn to? Who else forgives the sins of the big sinners, right? Who is the one that, um, you know, forgives the one who committed that 99, 100 murders, right? Who, who else is there that other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can forgive sins no matter how many there they are, right? And note when you begin to think like this, it, you know, he added this, when you begin to think like this, who do you think is pleased with this way of thinking that I'm just too far from Allah because of my sin, so I can't ask for his forgiveness. I'm not worthy of Allah's forgiveness. I don't deserve it because of my sins. Who do you think is happy when we think like this? Allah or shaitan? Because Allah has promised to answer our prayers, but shaitan is the one who would love for us to think like this so that we lose motivation to make dua or to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek forgiveness, right? But guess what? This is the really cool thing that Shaykh Muhammad mentioned, Allah ta'ala. Shaitan wants us to think like this, but 
he himself does not think like this. Because didn't he turn to Allah and make dua when he said in Surah Al-A'raf, which I've already studied, verse 14, قَالَ أَنظِرْنِي إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Shaytan said to Allah, give me respite. He made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He asked Allah, he turned to Allah and asked Allah to give him respite until the day that they are resurrected until the day of judgment, right? Because he knows Allah. He knows Allah answers the du'as, you know, of his creation. He, he hears their du'as um, he, and he answers them. He is mujib, right? So like, so Shaykh Muhammad asked if Hena's classic style, rahimahullah, you know, are you shaitan? You know, are you, you're, no one is worse than shaitan, right? Because regardless of our sins, we all say la ilaha illallah, right? So no one is worse than shaitan and you are not shaitan. So, um, this is just one of his deceptive tactics. And, we, you know, we need to recognize that and not just let it become part of our thinking and just, you know, then fall into this destructive, uh, you know, thought process. So another thing he mentions, uh, Allah, is that whatever mentality or pattern of thought that removes the motivation or power from your dua, that de-energizes your dua or your motivation to make dua, that thought pattern, that mentality is from shaitan. So beware. So the concluding lesson here, as um, Salih Ali Islam, you know, concludes the ayah with "Inna Rabbi Qaribun Mujib." Indeed, my Rabb is Qarib. He is close, and he is Mujib, right? Not just Qarib, not just close to us. Because imagine if Allah was close to us, but then He would never answer the prayers, right? If He wasn't Mujib, right? Um, what would that be like? So. Here we are given the full constellation, the double constellation. Not only is he very close, but he is also very receptive to our prayers. He answers the call of the caller when he or she calls upon him, right? And Sheikh Saadi mentions in the seat of this that he is close to whoever calls upon him for a need or calls upon him regarding his worship. Um, you know how all of us sometimes go through this, oh, I don't know if my worship is accepted or not. I don't know if my prayer is accepted, my recitation of Quran is accepted. Anything I do is accepted or not. Well, we should make dua to Allah to accept our ibadah because he is mujib. He does answer prayers. And part of our prayer can be, oh, Allah, accept my ibadah, right? So that is something we can hope for then to be accepted because not only does he respond to requests, but he also um, you know, accepts our worship. This is part of his sifa, that he accepts the ibadah and he gives reward uh, for it. This is part of him being receptive to us, not just to our du'as, but also to our actions, which include worship, right? This is part of him being receptive. Um, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I just want to conclude with, I thought this was like a really cool example about, um, imagine if you had the phone number of a really powerful president or king. And you know you were told that, you know, he's right here, he's right next door, he's right in the next room. And he always picks up his phone and he loves it when people ask, ask him for things. And the longer your list is, the more he loves it, the more he loves to listen to you. You know, he loves listening to you and you can go on and on and he just loves it. And he's always available. There's no appointment that you need to make and whatever you are going to ask, either he's going to grant it to you or he's going to give you something better, right? Now or later, depending on, uh, you know, what, whatever is the best situation for you. And subhanAllah, I was thinking if a person like this existed, which by the way, does not exist, how often would you call this president? If you really believed that there is such a president and that he is available and he is really like this, how often would you call the president and how excited would you be about making these calls? Something to think about. Okay, let's look at verse 62. Qalu, they said, so this is now the people of Thamud, the people of Saleh Al-Sam answering. They said, Ya Saleh, O Saleh, Qada, indeed, Kunta, you were, Fina, among us, Marujuwa, someone in whom you place great hopes. Qabla, before Hada, this. Atanhana, do you forbid us? An that na'buda, we worship ma that ya'budu, worship abauna, our forefathers. Wa innana, and indeed we lafi, certainly in shak, doubt, mimma, with regards to that. Tadauna, you call us towards ilayhi, 
towards it. Murib, again, something that is like a disquieting doubt or a, a cause of doubt or in a state of doubt. So verse 62, they said, O Saleh, until now you were one of those among us in whom we placed great hopes. Now would you forbid us to worship what our forefathers were wont to worship? Indeed, we are in a disquieting doubt about what you are calling us to. So basically they're saying, O Saleh, you have really disappointed us. We had such high hopes in you before this. You know, you were such a promising uh, individual in our society. So subhanAllah, you know, this in fact, uh, the Tafsir mentions is a confession on their part, how he was in fact the best character among them, right? Sheikh Saadi mentions here, they just confessed to, uh, you know, the greatness of his character, how he had the best uh, outst outstanding uh, characteristics as a human being, as a person, right? Um, to the point that they had so many good hopes and expectations that, you know, that he was such a promising uh, individual. And Maududi says the same, we'd expected by your wisdom, intelligence, foresight, serious behavior, dignified personality, that you would become a great and prosperous man. We had looked forward to the great success you would achieve and to the manifold many advantages you would gain over other clans and tribes because of you. But you have brought, you know, all our hopes to nothing. You, now you're on Tawheed. Now you're talking to us about a hereafter. You want us to leave the ways of our forefathers that we're upon? Like, you know, you really disappointed us. You know, this is not what we, this is not the path we thought you would take in life, that you know, you become this preacher, messenger, prophet, telling us to come to Tawheed, leave off shirk, what our, you know, illustrious forefathers did. And, you know, you've ruined yourself by going on this path, which is not the path of our um, ancestors. And although they also mentions, Allah Ta'ala, that the people of Muhammad وسلم, the Quraysh and Makkah had the same similar great expectations from Prophet Muhammad, uh, from Muhammad bin Abdullah before he became a prophet. They had such high expectations from him. They had a very high opinion of his abilities and capabilities before he became the prophet. You know, he's Al Amin. And they thought he was going to become a great leader and, you know, they would benefit so much as a tribe, you know, gain advantages perhaps over other tribes because of his foresight. And, uh, ability, but when, contrary to their expectations, he began to call them to Tawheed and to an Akhirah, and that this is not it. There's going to be a next life, and you are going to be held responsible for what you did here. And he taught them morality, and you know, taught to, uh, you know, asked them to stop doing all the uh, you know immoral practices they were upon. They lost all hope in him, and they started to have the opposite opinion about him. You know, what a pity. This man who was so good until now, now he's under the influence of some charm. You know, he's under some influence of some black magic, right? He's ruined his career, his, his, you know, his prospects, and he's destroyed all our hopes as well. And I couldn't help but thinking, subhanAllah, how disappointing it is sometimes for parents or elders in our community when an intelligent, bright student goes into like Islamic studies instead of medicine or engineering, right? We kind of get that kind of reaction, but anyhow. So their issue with Saleh is, wait, you're going to forbid us from the worship of those gods that our forefathers worshiped? Like, how could you do such a thing? You know, we are in serious doubt about what you're calling us to. So again, we see how incredibly wrong thinking ruled the minds of the time. Like the most, Reasonable thing, though, hate the soundest concept, right? Uh, which is closest to the fitra to worship Allah's Pantara alone. That is deemed unreasonable. That is being critically questioned. And the flawed, doomed logic of shirk is popular and holds sway in society and is the way to go. So, this reminded me of the lesson that our uh, great beloved teacher, Shaykh Muhammad Akhmadwi, Ta'ala teaches us constantly is that society is not a standard of truth. It is not a reference for truth. You don't learn truth from your society, from what people are doing, from customs or traditions. You don't do what people are doing around you just because they are doing it, just because this is trending in society. 
truth is known through revelation, which confirms what is already subconsciously known by the fitra. Something to keep in mind. Okay, let's look at verse 63. Verse 63, he said, so Salih uh, السلام, says, Ya Qumi, oh my people, them. have you considered or don't you see in if kuntu, I was ala, upon bayina, a proof, an evidence, min from Rabbi, my Lord, my Rabb, wa'atani, and he gave me minhu from him, rahma, a mercy, faman, so who yansuruni will save me, Min Allah from Allah in if asaytu, if I disobeyed him. Fama so not tazidunani, so you were not increasing me. Ghaira in other than taqsir, loss. Verse 63. Saleh said, My people, what do you think or have you considered? Uh, so actually, the translation you have is better. Consider. If I had a clear evidence from my Lord and then he also bestowed his mercy upon me, who will rescue me from the punishment of Allah if I still disobey him? You can only make me lose even more. You will only contribute to my doom as you have here and you're only going to increase me in loss, right? So if I have a clear evidence, yani I have the truth from Allah and there's something to think about and apply directly to ourselves like right now. If I have the truth from my Lord and he has been merciful towards me and in spite of that, I disobey him, who is going to then save me from him? Yani, I will have no excuse to disobey him after I'm upon truth, after I have the Quran, after Allah's, I have been enjoying the mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa I have no excuse left to disobey him and to then feel that, you know, I can be saved from his, uh, from him. No one can save me. Oh, I had no excuse. So this is what uh, Salih Islam is addressing his people with. Have you ever considered the possibility? Have you ever even thought for a moment that, wait a minute, maybe Salih is speaking the truth. Have you entertained that idea that I may be upon a bayina, a strong, proper, correct evidence? And then he says, you know, Allah has bestowed his mercy upon me and he has made me a messenger, a, a, a nabi, right? He's made me a prophet. He has given me revelation. Can there be a greater mercy than this, right? That Allah were to guide you, that Allah were to tell you what he wants from you, which is why the state of the Quran and tafsir is so important. How else will I know what Allah wants from me, right? If you don't go to college, you know, it's uh, it may not be the, a great idea, but it's not something that, you know, um, is going to have consequences in the hereafter. But if you don't know what Allah wants from you, if you don't uh, read the Quran, if you don't get to know what Allah is asking, what he's saying, what his words mean, what are his commandments, what is prohibitions, then uh, that, can, that is doom. That is, that is true doom and destruction, right? When I don't know what Allah wants from me, how I can be saved in the akhirah. So this is why the state of the Quran is the most important thing to know what, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from me. So Salih al Islam is saying that if I were to disobey my Lord after having this received this evidence from him, who is going to save me? Right? If I were to stop calling you from the truth, if I were to start obeying you instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who would then save me from him? And really, uh, the answer is if I disobey Allah by discarding the guidance I have received from him in order to please you you cannot defend me against him. You will rather add to the intensity of my guilt of disobedience. I shall incur additional punishment for misleading you and showing the right way for which I've been sent to. Yani, I cannot stop do, doing my job, right? Salih alayhi salam's people, Samud, would have loved nothing more than for him to give up his preaching, his teaching, right? But if I'm not to, if I'm upon a bayina, if I have received profit and revelation, if I have clear evidence from my Lord, and then I disobey him and I stop preaching the truth and teaching the truth, um, then who is going to save me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You are inviting me to a prospect that will contribute to my doom. You're inviting me to a prospect that will not bring me benefit or increase, but will only increase me in loss and in ruin, right? So 
you know, a lesson for us, um, we are the carriers of the message of truth. After the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there are no more prophets, there are no more messengers, but we have the message, right? We don't have the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but we have the message. And part of our loyalty to our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to spread and teach this message to whoever will listen, right? Anyone who will listen, um, we, it's our job to continue to preach and teach uh, the message and not fear the people, right? But to be able to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this gesture of love and loyalty to him and his messenger that we try to do something, right? We try to tell the people, we try to continue um, this responsibility that was placed upon us. Okay, let's look at verse 64. Verse 64. Wa ya qawmi, and O oh my people, hadihi this naqatullah, this is a she-camel of Allah, lakum for you ayah, a sign, fadharuha, so leave her, ta'kul, eat, fi in ardillah, in the earth of Allah, wa and la do not tamasuha, do not touch her, bisu, with any evil, fayakhudakum, so will Overtake you a a punishment, qareeb, close, close at hand. 64. My people, this she camel of Allah is a sign for you, so let her pasture on Allah's earth and do not hurt her, do not hurt her, or else some punishment which is near at hand shall overtake you. Okay, now if you've never heard the story, you're probably confused about you know what is this she camel all of a sudden coming onto the scene. Here's the she camel of Allah, a sign for you. So basically, uh, Maraf al-Qur'an mentions how the people of Thamud had insisted that he must first, Salah al must first make a she-camel of a specific description. They were very specific, of a very specific kind. They wanted this type of she-camel to come out miraculously from a rock in the mountain that was in front of of them and that if he brought forth this miracle, then the people would believe that he indeed was a prophet of God. So Salih Islam warned them at that time when they made this crazy request is that you know if this miracle comes and you still don't believe, then you are going to be severely punished. So subhanAllah, Allah actually uh, made this miracle happen and lo and behold, this mountain which was in front of them and there was a rock in it and this she camels comes forth uh, with these specific characteristics, um, you know, before the people of Thamud. And the one thing they were taxed with or told to do after this point is don't touch her, leave her alone. Let her eat, let her graze on God's earth. Don't touch her or harm her uh, in any way. Otherwise, a horrible punishment is going to befall you. And, and it is mentioned how um, this she camel gave a lot of milk. Obviously, it's a special camel. And uh, they had a division of days, right? One day was the day for the she camel, and the other day the people get to drink uh, the milk, so on and so forth. Um, so their job was to not touch her, to leave her alone, let her graze, don't harm her, don't harm her in any way whatsoever. But lo and behold, what does Thamud do? Let's look at 65. So they slaughtered her. So he said, Yani. Salih alayhi salam said, Tamatau, enjoy fi in darikum your homes, fala fata, three ayam days, thalika, that wa'adun, a promise, ghayru, not makadub, shall not be denied or belied. Uh, belied actually is the correct word. 65. But they slaughtered her, thereupon Salih warned them, enjoy yourselves in your homes for a maximum of three days. This is a promise which shall not be belied, which shall not be proven false, right? So what did they do after the exact miracle they wanted is manifested before them and their response being the people they were, instead of it being a response of tawheed and gratitude and of repentance, they slaughter the she camel, which they're not supposed to you know, bring any harm to. They cut its legs, they cripple it. And this was the beginning of the end for them, they were told by Saudi Arabia after this point, okay, wait and enjoy yourself just three more days. On the fourth day, the punishment is going to descend upon you. And it is a punishment now at this point, it cannot be averted by any means. 
This is a promise of Allah that will not be proven false. Verse 66, فَلَمَّا So when جَاءَ came amruna our command, نَجَّيْنَا We rescued صَالِحًا صَالِحْ وَالَّذِينَ And those amanu had believed ma'ahu along with him بِرَحْمَةٍ By a mercy minna from us وَمِنْ And from خِزْيِ The humiliation يَوْمِئِذْ Of that day. Inna indeed, Rabbaka, your Lord, huwa he al qawiyu the strongest, al aziz, the most powerful, right? 66. Then, when our command came to pass, we saved Saleh and those who shared his faith by our mercy from the disgrace of that day. Truly, your Lord is all strong, all mighty. So, we see when the command of punishment came, Allah's Padra saves his beloved Prophet Saleh and those that had believed along with him out of his mercy towards them. He saves them from the disgrace and the humiliation that overtook the people of Saleh alayhi Maududi mentions how according to uh, traditions that are current in the Sinai Peninsula, Allah delivered them from the torment and led them to that particular region. Come on. Uh, a mount near Jabal Musa, uh, known by the name. Um, it, it is said that that's where Salih al Islam went to after his people were destroyed. Him and his people were led to this particular place where they sought refuge and were rescued, and that's where they went a place in the Sinai Peninsula. And Allah knows best. So, subhanAllah, yeah, you know, as the verse ends with verse 66, in the Rabbaka, who will qawi ul aziz. Surely your Lord is all powerful, all mighty. Allah's huwa, his power is terrifying. It is something we cannot grasp, something we cannot bear. Uh, and child, if you could all mute yourself, that would be wonderful. If you could just please all place yourselves on mute. So Allah's huwa is terrifying something we cannot grasp, something we cannot bear. We ask him to grant us his mercy, to handle us with his mercy, to care for his might, uh, you know, to, to, to care for us um, because his might, his power, that, you know, so these are beyond human tolerance, beyond human imagination, beyond human tolerance, you know. Al-Qawi, Al-Aziz. Al-Aziz, yani, one who becomes a ghalib, one who dominates, one who overwhelms, you know, one who cannot be, uh, no one can have ghalba or dominance over him, right? And subhanAllah, if you learn the way that the Thamud were annihilated, destroyed, it is nothing short of terrifying. And we're going to learn that in verse 67. And أخذ took الَّذِينَ those, or overtook is probably better, ظلموا and overtook those who had oppressed or transgressed الصيحة. الصيحة literally a cry or a shriek. فأصبحوا so they became في in ديارهم, their homes, جاثمين, lifeless, but it's in a particular way which I'll explain in the tafsir. Verse 67, and the blast overtook those who were wont to do wrong, and then they lay lifeless in their homes. And let's do 68 with this because it goes uh, with the previous. As if they did not live or prosper fiha in it. Indeed, Thamud kafaru belied or denied. Rabbahum, their Lord, ala bu'ad al thamud Indeed, bu'ad, again, that distance that uh, we talked about that Ad was smitten with, also was for thamud. Um, so let's do 67, 68 together. And the blast overtook those who uh, transgressed and or, or oppressed, and then they lay lifeless in their homes as though they had never lived there before. Overly, the Thamud denied their Lord, or oh, the Thamud were destroyed. Now, mind boggling when you think about the way Thamud were destroyed, it says Al Sayha, right? Al Sayha was what overtook Thamud, which is translated as the blast. It really was a sound, right? It, it was just so overwhelming that it, it's, it's actually a good translation to call it the blast. But 
what is a blast? It's like a sound, right? It was a, it was a shriek, a horrible scream, which was severe and it was terrifying. And the word in, in Arabic, al-sayha, it's also used for like the, you know, the sound you hear when wood is being sawed or like when a cloth tears, right, down the middle. There's like this shrieking sound, like this shrill sound, you know, very like disturbing. This was the nature of the sound that overtook them. It was a horrible cry that went forth over these people. And it was such a powerful and terrible cry at the same time that once it went forth, it tore the hearts of everyone who heard it. It literally split asunder the hearts of the people like astaghfirullah like you know what will make us fear allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like what will convince us of his power and his might like what will discourage us from sinning and from you know changing our ways if, if these verses don't right literally they their hearts were torn apart rent asunder like split and they were found dead death uh, so they translated it as as, as lifeless uh, if you go back to verse 67, uh, Aisha, if you turn back to 67, I just want to see that. Yeah, so it, it also has lifeless. Jethimin is, yes, they had become lifeless, but upon their knees. So they had fallen face forward, chest forward in uh, on, their, on their knees in this position of, uh, you know, uh, of being dead. This, this is the position that they were found dead in the next day, right? Astaghfirullah, may Allah protect us from his punishment in this world and the next and allow us to take Ibra. Not a single sound came forth from Thamud after that sound. That was the sound of their destruction, their end. There were no more, they had no more arguments left, right? What happened to all the arguments? Every time we question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every time we raise our sound, our voice, to question Allah and resist him and his commands, we should think about this sound, this, this voice, this shrill, this cry, this shriek, because you know who's, where the shriek issued from? The Tafsir mentioned that this awesome cry or scream was came from Jibreel alayhi salam. And it was the most terrorizing, more terrorizing than all the combined thunderbolts of you know, worldly lightning uh, the Ma'ad of Al-Quran mentions was more terrorizing than all the combined thunderbolts of worldly lightning. You know how when all of a sudden there's a thunderbolt, we get um, we get scared. It's just a natural human reaction. But this was so much worse you know, than anything we can imagine and beyond what human beings could tolerate. And so they became dead. Their hearts ripped apart. Literally, the human senses could not take it. And, you know, um, this horrific sound resulted in the mass destruction of those people. And you have this actually mentioned in various the, 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 the effect that it had uh, on their heart. And also um, in the Surah Al-A'raf, which we have covered, it is mentioned about Thamud that they were um, overtaken by an earthquake. So there's no discrepancy or a contradiction between the two. One could have happened um, after the other, right? Um, it's possible the earthquake uh, was first and then the severe sound came or vice versa, Allah knows best. But their annihilation was complete as we learned from verse 68, right? Um, as if they had never lived there. If you bring up 68 on the screen, their annihilation was so, their destruction was so complete. It was as if they had never lived there. This, you know, mighty people that remember used to carve their homes from the mountains after the scream issued forth, it is as if they had never flourished in those lands. It is as if they had never inhabited those lands, right? Those people that had been so powerful, they underwent complete devastation with, with one scream or earthquake as a, you know, or, or combination, as if they had never lived there. So, we see Thamud mentioned in the same horrid way that Ad are mentioned in the Quran, they are highlighted for their kufr. They are highlighted for their kufr, right? Uh, and the same bu'ad, the same destruction, distance from Allah's mercy and khayb that afflicted Ad also afflicted Thamud, right? They became a symbol of extreme wretchedness and humiliation. 
And I'm going to conclude with uh, this verse with the narration from the Sahih of Imam Muslim, where Abdullah bin Umar reported that the people encamped along with Allah's Messenger. So Abdullah bin Umar, Sahabi, he's talking about how they're with the Rasul, وسلم, and they encamped uh, in the Valley of Hijr, the habitation of Thamud, and they quenched their thirst from the wells of that area and they made the flour with it, right? So you take flour, water, you add um, water into flour to make the uh, dough merge. So they quenched their thirst from the wells and needed, or the flour, made the flour with it. Thereupon Allah's messenger, when the Rasulullah found out that this is what they had done, he commanded that the water collected for drinking should be spilled and the flour should be given to the camels, the dough that had been made with that water should be given to the camels and commanded that the water for drinking that they should drink from should be taken from the well that was the well where the camel of uh, Saudi Arabia used to come and drink from. So they are so cursed. They are so distanced from the mercy of Allah's Prophet that the Prophet forbid even the drinking of the water from the same source that they used to drink from. You know, this is how they continue to have the curse and the humiliation uh, and the bu'ad, that distance. Right? The messenger of Allah wants to distance himself from them and from anything that has to do with them, not even their water. After all those, uh, you know, all that eras had elapsed between uh, Thamud and Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So with that, inshallah, we conclude our lecture for today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to benefit from the stories of the uh, Quran and inshallah be able to teach them and spread them to others. Subhanahu wa bihamdika la ila illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayka. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alaykum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.